Gentlemen, welcome to uh, the a joint committee of the uh, how, um, Homelessness and Poverty uh, and Housing uh, Committees. My name is Marquise Harris Doss, and I'm chair of the Homelessness and Poverty Committee. We're being joined uh, by the person who will be chairing this meeting, the, our um, illustrious chair of a housing uh, committee for the city of Los Angeles, um, the senior statesman among us. The one and only recently victorious Gil Cedillo. Let's welcome him here. Uh, we're joined by Council Members Price, uh, Coretz, uh, Bonin, and we saw our, um, Mr. Chairman. We were going to start with the uh, multiple items, public comments, uh, to do those at the beginning of the meeting. So I have one person, I think, on every item, uh, and his name is Herman. Herman, you'll have uh, a total of three minutes uh, to speak. I thought it was two plus one. Is it three plus three plus one? Three plus one. You have a total of four minutes to divide as you see fit. I think it's three. And Mr. Chair, just for the record, uh, uh, Mr. Spindler is already attempting to disrupt the meeting by barking in the back of uh, uh, the meeting room. So uh, Did it sound I like think this? You should be giving wow. some sort wow. of some sort of warning. Thank nice you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Gretz. You start your time. Three minutes. Since homelessness has become the increasing problems in Los Angeles, what are we going to do with that $132 million? How do we plan to spend it? Do we have a plan? Do you have a plan, Mr. Koretz? Does anyone have here have a plan? Weezar doesn't have a plan because he's the one that created development community uh, block grants regulation. But the problem is, some elected officials have become the slum and the blight of our communities by allowing what? Homelessness to be not addressed. You put people in other cities. You encourage people to leave L.A. and be pushed into other cities, occupy the riverbeds, and now you want to kick people out of the riverbed. Why don't you build homes in the riverbed so that the homeless can sleep in the river and enjoy the amenities of water flowing? <sighs> or better... Why don't you find a way to actually spend $132 million? That's what I told the county board of supervisor, that fucking creep, Ridley Thomas, who used county money to build a barn, or I'm sorry, his garage into a home to sleep in. Air conditioning in a garage? I thought garages were for plum parking your vehicles. But instead, no. See, we have politicians that like to be bad boys, right? Corruption, scandal. This I'm on topic, topic. sir. Uh, if you want to go to your general public comments, we can reduce it to a minute. I'm talking about the slum and blight findings. For example, in Crenshaw, the redevelopment area. It's not, that's not a problem? It's not? What about item CD8? Development on the 88th Vermont permanent support of housing? There's no fucking support of housing. That's why we have $132 million sitting somewhere to be split up into, into bags or, or pushed under the table in an envelope. Because at 88th in Vermont, you still have homeless people living in the goddamn street. So I don't know what fucking stupid schmuck politician asshole thinks he's smarter, smarter than me, but come up with a solution. I got a solution. Spend the fucking money on homeless people and get 88th Street in Vermont up to par. And then re regarding proposals for selection of one more vendor and information technology, that's not fucking important. It's not. That's item four, so I'm on topic. And then I go to item two, Los Angeles Housing Community Investment, uh, HCIDLA. Fuck them too. Fuck all these items and fuck all of you white politicians that fuck up our communities and created homelessness for the last 10 years. Fuck you white niggers too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen who are new to this uh, process, uh, you will appreciate that uh, we are under some restrictions that were enshrined in the Constitution's uh, Bill of Rights, uh, freedom of speech, especially as it relates to the government. So we have to allow... Uh, as offensive as the language is and as uncalled for it is, as it is, uh, we are not uh, allowed to uh, restrict their um, conversation. Mr. Spindler. All right. 
So, the uptight ones are here. What are you uptight about? Well, let's see. You're uptight because people come to meetings and talk on these items of the puppet, like number six, requesting the city attorney. You don't want to request anything from your city attorney because your city attorney can't implement an ordinance. They can't even file a criminal complaint and a misdemeanor without forging a signature on it. Go to Van Nuys, case number 7VW01632, and you'll see Mr. Eugene Hall forge a signature in a criminal complaint. So I would not have the city attorney drafting the ordinance. I would have this panel retain outside counsel and do it the right way so you don't get sued for stupid mistakes. And that's what all this is about. You guys, all of this stuff, HHH, all of these propositions, you guys have an attorney that drafts this stuff. Your city attorney with 700 plus attorneys is conflicted. They have absolutely no ethical right to do any of this work because they're conflicted. And all of this stuff going on right now, I'll give you a prediction what will happen is that some smart lawyer will be listening to this right now later on in their law office when they want to challenge one of these things. They'll look up and they'll see Mr. Rossiter's bar complaint. They'll look up my lawsuits and then they'll say, I know what we're going to do to overturn HCIDLA. We're going to claim their attorneys didn't represent their client, the city of Los Angeles, and filed an ultra virus action. And that's exactly what your internal memorandum have shown on Rule 23 motions filed on Planning Commission and HCID when you do a 245, is that you're violating the city charter because your city attorney is ultra virus in action. And they sit on the council floor and tell the councilman, you can do it, but in close session, in writing, no, it's illegal. So that's the kind of legal advice you're getting. And all of you under Monell versus City of New York and the Bain Act under 52.1 can all be sued personally and your statutory immunity waived for unlimited liability. One of you guys is named in one of my lawsuits. Which one is it? Well, the guy's smiling. There you go. No, not you, Weezer. I'm never going to sue Weezer. I like Weezer. I'm not going to sue Cedillo. Not even you, Peppa. And then, of course, Mr. PDQ. Oh, I'm running out of time, but you know about Mr. Sven. All right. Uh, we have uh, some general public comment items. Uh, folks have one uh, minute to speak on any item within the jurisdiction of uh, either committee, homelessness and poverty or housing. And so we have someone named Hetty, and I'm not going to try the last name works for uh, the famous Mr. Greenberg, and then we have Mr. Harold Greenberg, and Robert Margus, you guys can come on up. Take some time. Good, after good afternoon, council members, councilmen, chairman. At this point, we're dealing with a big crisis that's not necessarily homelessness at the moment, but it will become homelessness soon, within two weeks. There has been two lockouts issued at 931 East Pico and 1518 South Paloma Street. There were fire department lockouts. We're in dire need of help to provide relocation funds for the tenants in those buildings so that they are not homeless in, in, by the 22nd, which is about two weeks away. And we need the housing department to work with us and help us to put the funds together because the landlord is a slumlord. And we need help at this point. I'm going to actually give my minutes away to Mr. Greenberg and let him take over. As you know, as a former president of the Apartment Association, Greater Los Angeles, I represent owners. In this case, I'm not representing the tenants, which is shocked that city attorney's office and the housing department. We have a major crisis, and it is in Council District 14. The tenants here have orders to vacate. The owner, who has a federal prosecution, is a member of the cartel, money laundering. The city attorney's office has prosecuted him twice in the past 
prosecuting him now as being a slumlord, and Agla is trying to help the tenants in this particular case. We need your help. The owner was supposed to provide relocation fees on the 19th of May. He did not. Housing Department doesn't have the money. We have to look to City Council. We have over 10 people in the audience. We're not just talking adults. We're talking babies. We don't want more homeless. And we're looking to Council District 14, and we're looking for the rest to help these people. Otherwise, we have a disaster on our hands comparable to Oakland. These are warehouses. Thank you. Hello, Council, fellow citizens of Los Angeles. My name is Robert <coughs> Martis. I'm here mostly to represent my son and my neighbor, my cancer-driven neighbor that was driven out of her house. We, for the last seven months, we've worked with the city. We've given as much information as we can, and we've been model citizens as much as we can be. Uh, we have no money. Uh, we haven't been able to work in our art studios that we pay premium rates for. My three-and-a-half-year-old son has been harassed by security guards. We have had no Police officers come when they've threatened my life and my health. I've had to send my son away while we're battling this drug lord and slum lord for legally entitled relocation. If a child and a cancer patient and a single father can't get relocation, where do your laws stand? Like, what, what, do, what do we even have these laws for if we're not entitled to anything? Um, I just want to say that there's a lot of us here that can't even make it because we're trying to hustle up enough money to get out. Thank you. Um, Yakov Rabinovich, Royce Burke, and DJ Park. Uh, hello, council members. Uh, I'm also a tenant at 931 Pico. Um, and but it has to all the same things you've heard from Hattie and Harold and Rob. Uh, I've been a tenant there for two and a half years. I know some people who have lived in the building for much longer than that, over five years, over seven years. Um, these uh, live-work units were sold to us um, in a way where they were pitched to us as live-work, as a place where uh, you can run a business and make money on the side, do photo shoots, and really they were sold to us in a way where this will almost materialize on its own. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the artist community was targeted in, uh, by our landlord, who is a slumlord, who is under all kinds of investigations and has not been uh, helpful or cooperative at all um, in working with us. So I urge you guys to help us out in any way you can. Hello, council members. Um, I'm also here as a tenant at 931 East Pico Boulevard. Um, I've lived there for three, three, three and a half years, I believe. And um, same thing was also sold or rented the unit as a, a live work unit, um, primarily living for myself, my wife, and my um, close friend and roommate. Um, We've now come to see that uh, none of the units have any permits or anything that actually qualifies them as living units, and we've been paying premium rates. Um, now, as of bef before all this started, up to almost Arch District crisis. Um, so we are obviously going to be forced out very shortly, and um, with Ben not providing any of the legally provided relocation assistance. We really need to find help from the city council. Thank you. Um, similar situation as everyone. I'm a tenant at 937. It hasn't even been a year for my company. Uh, we've actually invested a lot of money into renovating the place to use it. And then a, within a month, we get a notice saying that all this is going on. So, um, still looking for a place to move, um, just down on 10K, just reinvesting into the location. Uh, so, any help? I mean, we have families and people that have businesses that was being utilized in there, but once the fire department told us, you know, there's restrictions, that just came to a stop. Thank you. Thank you.
Erica Weitzel, Parker, and Matthew. Hi, my name is Erica Weitzel. I've been living at 931 East Pico for about two and a half, almost three years. And we were sold these units as work-live lofts and everything that they sold us about the unit has turned out to be false. They promised us that they would help with photo shoots and make money that way. And they haven't done anything like that. And actually it's just the opposite. They've had uh, Firewatch there who's Security fire watch, we don't really know. They don't really do their job and they all they do is harass us um, for doing photo shoots and things like that on the side. We haven't been able to work and um, I'm asking for relocation money because uh, we need relocation money to move out. We've invested a lot of money into these places and moving an art studio is a really expensive thing to do. And so I'm really hoping that this doesn't turn into a homelessness issue and with the gentrification that's been going on downtown LA, it's really hard to find an affordable place. I'm hoping that Los Angeles can lead the way in doing that. Thank you. Councilmen and women, thank you. Um, so as of today, it's obviously past June 8th, which is um, the deadline we had to be out. Thankfully, the fire department uh, cooperatively helped us move it to the 22nd. Um, we're just looking for your cooperation in handling this and getting our relocation. Um, thank you so much. Hello, Council. Um, my name is Matt, and uh, I'm a tenant over at 931, and I've been there for like two and a half years, and uh, just uh, recently we've been notified we have two weeks to get out, and uh, as the 22nd, and just that's, not enough time for myself to, like, you know, gain any kind of like income because we haven't been able to work or anything like that. And to provide myself to move forward, it's like going to be extremely hard for myself to do so. Um, we wouldn't even be in this situation in the first place if it wasn't for this landlord, like, uh, just providing us in the first place. Uh, and uh, there's just been all kinds of rules, and like, he's putting, putting us in danger for, like, you know, like putting all these. Uh, violations, these fire code violations, and when we've like come to enter the building, they've had us like try to check our like IDs to check if we live there, and like just been a hassle from the start. And if the city could come together and like help us relocate, because the housing department has. It. Thank you, uh, Reginald Woods, uh, Teresa Flowers. Hi, members of the council. My name is Reggie Woods. Thank you so much for having um, this opportunity. Um, I wanted to start with, I moved to LA um, as an artist because I felt that the city takes so much pride in its relationship with the arts. Um, there's always, every time I come here as a visitor, I was so attracted to um, people being able to come here and in so many industries, having the opportunity to grow and flourish here, because um, I feel like that's just what California represents. Um, but moving into the building, I think things have taken a, a vast, crazy change. Um, and I think I, the, the biggest thing I keep thinking about is that our security deposit and our first last month's rent are also on hold. So those are funds that usually you use to move. We don't have that opportunity um, and we don't have those things. We've um, been locked out of our own buildings, um, asked for IDs. We've, there's the elevators are broken, there's doors broken. So when moving out, how are we supposed to facilitate that if we don't have access to the, those things? Um, thank you for the time. Hi, I'm Teresa Flowers. I'm from 931 Pico. Thank you so much for listening to me. Um, I've lived at 931 East Pico for two years. I'm an artist and an educator, and I have a live workspace there that I have spent two years cultivating and making a gallery, and I also was hoping to teach classes and do a lot of creative things in my space. Um, we do have a broken elevator. I have um, a disease called AS, ankylosing spondylitis, um, which affects my hands and my back. And I'm not able to take things up and down the stairs, so it's been really hard for me. I'm having to depend on other people to help me. 
Um, but the hardest part is the financial situation where we're not getting our deposits back, um, where we, we haven't gotten relocation funds. I've had to sell everything I own, um, including all my work stuff, my strobes. I'm a photographer. Not only am I in fear of being homeless, I have lost, lost all the means to actually have a business. And I'm just asking for your guys' help. You know, you guys are in a situation where you could really help us. And, um, you know, I really believe, I, be I believe that I believe in our city and I believe that you guys will help us. Um, I just want to say that please help us now. We were supposed to be out tomorrow. Um, I'm in the process of losing everything. If you guys step in to help us, you know, we can have a bright future. Artists are the heart of this city. We are what has made it so valuable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, that, uh, one more speaker. One more? No, two? No. Okay, one more side. Nope. That closes public comment. Closes public comment. Thank you so much. Um, item one? Item one. It's a CAO report relative to Proposition HHH. Uh, good afternoon, Yolanda Chavez with the CAO's office. I'm joined today by Rushmar Cervantes, general manager for HCID, and Ed Gibson, uh, director of housing for HCID, and Meg Barclay, who's our director of um, homelessness for the city. Um, the report before you today is the, are the recommendations that the Administrative Oversight Committee for Prop for the Prop HHH uh, AOC are, are are moving forward for your final approval. And so these recommendations are in relation to the first issuance for the Prop HHH bonds and include recommendations for both the housing and facilities program. I think as you remember, um, back in February, you designated um, HCID as the departmental sponsor for the housing program for Prop HHH, and you designated the CAO as the departmental sponsor for the facilities program. You also authorized HCID to review the projects in their managed pipeline to determine which, which projects were ready to be funded with the first bond issuance. The other thing that you authorized was the CAO issuing an expedited RFP to identify facilities that would be eligible for funding under the first bond issuance. Uh, of course, this RFP was issued once the Citizens Oversight Committee and the Administrative Oversight Committee reviewed and approved it. So all of the recommendations before you have been considered by the Prop HHH Citizens Oversight Committee and the Administrative Oversight Committee and are now presented to you for final approval. I would like to turn over now to Rushmore who will review the recommendations for the House and Program. Thank you, Rosha, Londa, and good afternoon, council members. Uh, this is an exciting day for us as we bring forward to you the, the first series of projects funded under HHH. As Yolanda indicated, uh, we went through our a list of projects that we had in our pipeline, and right off the bat, we're able to identify nine projects that, were s that could utilize HHH funds. All of them are transit-oriented development projects. Uh, we're going to be able to finance 615 units total 416 of those are permanent supportive housing for homeless. Of that, 225 are for chronic homeless. It's going to take $73 million to, to finance that with these HHH bond proceeds. What's important to note, though, the total development cost is $262 million. So we're leveraging it almost four to one with an additional $189 million we're bringing to the table. Um, I guess I mentioned all of these are TOD projects, but we'll have 55-year covenants on them. They will also have project-based Section 8 vouchers to cover the rent subsidy, as well as they will have uh, wraparound services provided from the County of Los Angeles. 
Also within the recommendations is uh, a $1.2 million budget line item for administrative costs. That will cover basically uh, all ac activities from underwriting to the point where the project is placed in service. That's what the bond will cover. Thereafter, we'll have to identify resources thereafter uh, once they're placed in service. The second part of what you have before you is the overall program, how we'd like to proceed on a go-forward basis, and this was approved by the AOC and the COC, as Yolanda had mentioned. We took in consideration uh, trans uh, transparency, speed, as well as leverage. Now, the latter two, speed as well as leverage, don't necessarily go hand in hand. So we're going to really walk a tight line between trying to get projects out as quickly as possible at the same time being able to provide maximum leveraging. So I think that we designed and what the two committees had approved are, are going to help us achieve that. Um, how we're going to uh, get additional projects into the pipeline uh, as opposed to doing an annual sale like we have before you now for H HH bond proceeds, we're going to do calls three times a year. The call will look at uh, a level of uh, applicability relative to number of units it's going to be able to finance. Is it providing 50% of, of the units for supportive housing? Another 50% of that have to be for chronic homeless. And does the council support that? If they meet that threshold, then our intention is to come back to the committee, council, and the mayor's office to be able to issue a letter of commitment. It's a conditional conditional letter of commitment to give that developer the ability with that piece of paper from the city of Los Angeles saying that they, we have a commitment. They can go, other, go out and s find alternate sources of money, either from the state of California uh, or the county of Los Angeles or, or perhaps some, some other source of monies. Uh, no place like home dollars. It's one point, uh, excuse me, two billion dollars that the state's making available. Six hundred million of that will, or a little bit more than that, will be made available by the county of Los Angeles. That will become a primary source for HHH funded projects in the future, beginning in 2018. Once we're able to bring in these resources, we will come back to you with an annual sale of the bond. So throughout the course of the year, three calls per year, the developers will come back to us when they have uh, another source of monies. We will align, align that either primarily through a 4% bond financing or potentially a 9%. Uh, because of the limited amount of home funds, 9%, that's traditionally been the how we've matched those. We will utilize 4%. And what you have before you today, the nine projects, eight of the nine are 4% bond financing. And the reason why that's important to note is that requires additional level of funding just because of the equity pricing of a 4% is less than a 9%. So it'll cost us a little bit more money on the, the gap financing, but the important thing is to note that we want to make sure that the developers with that letter of commitment are going out and finding another source of monies so that when and doing calls three times a year, we ensure that we'll, we'll have product in the pipeline at any given time. So at this time, every single year, working with the CAO's office, we'll be coming forward with a project expenditure plan that will have projects teed up, ready to go, have site control, and have a level, a level, a level of commitment from the council office before we proceed forward to, for the bond sale. Um, the goal ultimately is 1,000 units per year or 10,000 a year. We've sized the pricing of the, yes? A thousand a year, ten thousand over the course of ten years. That is, that's the goal. So we've sized the pricing of what we would commit to projects at a hundred thousand and a hundred and forty thousand, uh, depending on the low income housing tax credit. We also, because of the pricing of of the tax credits being fluctuating and going downward after the presidential election, as well as construction costs going up, we added a supplemental eighty thousand dollars per uh, unit on a one-time basis, and we want to revisit that as years go on because uh, we, we want to make sure that we get product out the door, as I mentioned earlier in the, on the conversation about making sure we're getting projects out quickly, but also making sure we're leveraging. Because of the pricing they are right now, we need to make sure that we can meet that need. Not all the developers utilize that 220000 per unit subsidy uh, amount. Uh, most of them came in uh, far less. Uh, we will reevaluate as we do calls the project in the future based on what the pricing of the construction costs are. Um, I don't like to share this, but it is full disclosure right now that what we have uh, pricing point for these units is about $430,000 per unit. Um, again, these are things that we don't necessarily control. 
I think we'll be able to offset some of that in the future with some of the uh, city assets that we're putting, uh, uh, making available, working with the CAO's office as well as uh, within the HCID who have its own CRA assets that it inherited as well as other parcels it, it, it forecloses on and putting that out to bid for either first time home buyer but also affordable housing and HHH. Uh, we have 44 parcels that we're, develop we're entering into agreements right now with developers to negotiate and come back through the pipeline, either for affordable housing or supportive housing under the HHH program, and that will reduce the overall costs as well. And the plan in the future is to continue to look at city assets to be able to offer up for affordable housing as well, whether it be parking lots or any kind of spare land that's available that looks like it's developable, that that could then offset some of the costs uh, on, a, on a go forward basis. Um, this, this program is in parallel with the managed pipeline. We do two calls a year for that, and, and again, of course, three for HHH. We think that's an effective way to proceed, and it gives us the flexibility to be able to mix and match the dollars to ensure that we've got that maximum leverage. Um, and with that, I conclude just to let you know that uh, I think that what you have before you, uh, for you right now is a very positive step in the right direction, right off the bat being able to have this many units uh, out the gate for supportive housing uh, as well as affordable housing and when we when we're here this time next year we'll certainly have more uh, for you to look at good afternoon Meg Barclay uh, city homeless coordinator in the office of the CAO uh, the proposition HHH facilities program information before you in this report provides the results of the expedited RFP Yolanda mentioned, as well as program recommendations for identifying projects for the next PEP that will come around this time next year. Um, the expedited RFP results, we're recommending funding for six projects totaling $12 million. Five of those projects are non-city sponsors. One of them is a city-sponsored project. Um, two of these projects are also receiving funding from HCID through the PSH Prop HHH loan program. That's the 88th and Vermont project, as well as the Joshua House Health Center, which is um, associated, it, it's a part of the um, 649 Lofts project being developed by Skid Row Housing Trust. Um, unlike HCID, the CAO does not have and did not have and still does not have a pipeline of facilities projects. We don't, we, that's not how we're recommending administering this program. Um, um, for, I, that we could draw off of for this issuance. And so given the timing, we were, um, we needed to do a very, very expedited RFP process. So we received authority to do that from um, the council when the first, when that report went through in February and the um, administrative oversight committee by February 24th authorized us to uh, do that in with, we put the RFP out, we received responses two weeks after the RFP was released. And the following week, we had recommendations before the Citizens Oversight Committee. Um, the uh, funds will be awarded as loans with a service repayment requirement. The terms of those loans is um, equal to the useful life of the project, which would be estimated and certified by the city according to generally accepted accounting principles or other, other third party separate principles from, um, from this. Um, the city will may agree to allow services to change after a minimum period. Um, that would be 10 years or half of the useful life of the project, but that um, whichever of those numbers is greater. But at that point, a repayment requirement would be um, would be calculated based on the remaining useful life of the project under the service repayment loan agreement. Um, and that formula is in, in the report. It's a long one. Um, for to the 2018-19 um, PEP, we and the RFP to identify projects for that PEP, we're recommending a number of changes based on lessons learned from this expedited process. Um, the the changes fall into four separate little categories: um, the funding requirements, capacity requirements, coordination, and the location of need and distribution of projects. As it relates to funding, we're recommending a cap on the amount being made available for facilities. So we received 25 applications under this expedited process. So 25, when they had two weeks to respond, received 25 applications totaling over $70 million, indicating there's a lot of need out there um, for facilities programs, and only five of those did not pass threshold. So there's a potential to, uh, put out a lot of Proposition HHH funding for facilities when we really recommend that this program be primarily a housing program. 
So we're recommending a cap of a total 5% of the bond, of the total bond authority or $12 million. We recommend that apply only to um, non-city sponsored projects at this point. Uh, and so $50 million, $51 million remains under that cap if you were to approve that today. For the, I'm sorry, excuse me, yes, over the first five issuances. So that gives time to evaluate whether or not the oversight committees and, and the council and the mayor would like to increase the amount of funding being um, made available for facilities, but we felt like we needed that check-in point once we get to that cap amount. We're also um, recommending requiring minimum leverage of 15%. A lot of the applications that we received were requesting 100% funding, um, and we really felt feel that having this leverage requirement in there gives um, us a little more confidence that the pr proposers are, very, are committed to the projects and committed to making them happen on time. Um, it also helps the funding go a little bit farther. And, um, excuse me, we're also recommending, um, excuse me, sorry. We're also um, recommending a minimum and maximum request for a project. So a minimum request of, we wouldn't, we would ask that no one request less than $100,000 or more than three and a half million at this point. Neither of those two, the leverage or the minimum maximum, would have knocked out any of the projects that are being recommended today, just sort of using those as a guide point for the successful projects under this RFP. Um, and as it relates to capacity, because these bond, these projects are financed with bond funding, which has a lot more restrictions on it, uh, we really need to make sure that developers have capacity to implement the projects and provide the services that go with them, because we do not have the funding to provide money for services in these, in these facilities. So to demonstrate that a little more strongly, we're asking for a letter of good standing from service funders as a threshold requirement. And if LASA is one of their service funders, we would require that that letter come from LASA. Um, we would also request or require mandatory attendance at a bidders conference, and this time around we will hold two bidders conferences during the application period. And we will also, because a lot, we had a couple of applica applicants that put in multiple applications for multiple projects, and so we want to ask them for a little more information about how they would implement multiple projects if they received multiple awards. We also want to coordinate um, a little more explicitly with HCID and require um, disclosure if applications are coming in that are also applying under the PSH program, and also require a letter of acknowledgement from the council office for the council district in which the project is located. And um, we're also proposing five bonus points be allowed for um, projects based on projects located, if they can demonstrate that they are in an area of high need for the services where those services do not exist um, otherwise in those areas to try and make sure that we are making awards to projects where um, services may not currently be available. So, um, excuse me, this, um, we also, um, the report also outlines other program components, additional um, proposed evaluation criteria and an estimated calendar for completion of the RSP, RFP process. Um, we are making sure that uh, we are, sorry, excuse me, pr requiring providers to come to at least one of two bidders conferences, and we will make a vigorous Q&A effort. We had a very vigorous Q&A effort during the two-week um, application period, and we'll make sure to post responses to any questions received at least twice a week. Um, we are also obviously having a longer application period, as you can see in the calendar. Um, we, we're looking to release the RFP in mid-July and um, that not close the, the application due date would be in early November. So to give people more time to prepare applications. And um, again, all of those, those dates are included. For city-funded projects, we also recommend a process similar to how we're currently identifying projects for um, the city-sponsored storage facilities, which would require a council office in that area to introduce a motion indicating interest in establishing a city-funded Proposition HHH project. Um, city staff will, will review along BOE, um, CLA, CAO, and the council office review those that proposal together to determine the feasibility. And if it's determined to be feasible, that group would make a recommendation to the CAO to include it in the next PEP. Um, as far, there's also information in there about facilities program, or in this report about facilities program staffing. Um, in the, that's changed a little bit since we released the report. The um, 
FY1718 budget has been approved and an additional position has been approved for the CAO's office to help administer with the proposition, this RFP process for Proposition HHH Facilities Program. Um, if there, we are moving to hire this position as soon as possible, there's a limitation on the, the type of staffing costs associated with very specific projects that can be reimbursed with Proposition HHH, so we will track the time of our staff and, and just request reimbursement at the time that the, um, the PEPs come through at that point, just to make sure that we are only charging Proposition HHH for eligible costs. BOE will also be assisting with contracting and construction. Um, monitoring for each of the of the facilities programs since that's um, not a capacity we have in the CAO's office. And there was a question as this was making its way through council in the um, originally in related to whether or not the department of departments of city planning and building and safety would need any funding through proposition HHH to in administer their portions of the construction process. Um, they confirmed that their services related to Proposition HHH and other construction projects are fee funded and so their staff costs are recovered through the fees. That concludes my presentation. So I just wanted to touch on three final items that impact both the housing and facilities program. The first one being um, there was a question early on from the Citizens Oversight Committee on whether we can set priorities set aside or caps under the program. So could we do funding set asides for certain homeless populations? And so we checked with the city attorney and we cannot do that. That would be legal to do set asides for funding based on homeless population types. But if the city chose to, we could set priorities for population types. The other question that was asked was about the caps. And as you and as Meg stated, we are actually requesting that we set a cap, at least for the first five issuances for, for the facilities program. So that is legal to do. So, and then we can revisit that cap when we're getting close to the maximum funding under the cap. So we wanted to make you aware of those three issues. The other issue, again, as I think both Rushmore and Meg alluded to, was staff funding. And general obligation bonds, you know, it's the first time that we use geo bonds for this types of programs. If we, in the past, geo bonds have only been used for city owned facilities, such as fire stations and police stations. So it's a very, it's very challenging in terms of what we can um, pay for in terms of staffing. And so we've been having very extensive conversations with our bond council and city attorney. And one of the recommendations that they made, because again, we could only pay for staff costs from the time the project becomes a project. So from the time that HSIT provides an early commitment to the time that the project is completed and, and you know constructed. So that's the only staffing cost we can pay for. We cannot pay for drafting these reports for staffing the the COC, the AOC, et cetera. So one of the um, recommendations that came up is that maybe we should charge an underwriting fee going forward. Um, and of course, that underwriting fee would be part of the cost of the project. So, that, so we would just add that to the applicant's loan, right? So it's not something, it would not be an extra cost for them, it would be covered under the Prop HHH funding. So that recommendation is being evaluated. Um, we, would, we will probably note that that may be something that we will include in the next RFP and HSIP regulations, but we will take the recommendation when we're ready to make that recommendation to the COC, AOC, and then of course it would come to you for final approval. And finally, on reporting, um, we will issue both the HSIT and the CAO our first report um, six months after the first issuance and quarterly um, after that first report. They, of course, we will share with the COC, AOC, and City Council as, where, as well as our CAO debt group. It will definitely include at minimum the status of projects, status of expenditures, any explanations related to any delays, and estimated date of completion for each project. So with that, um, we're open to your questions. Yeah, I'll try to answer. Is that okay? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I am um, pleased to see that we've moved expeditiously on this. As um, you know, the uh, recent numbers on homeless uh, is not good news. But the good news is that at least we 
have started to move on this and something the city hasn't been doing much of for the past few decades. So that's the good news. Um, overall, I think the initial projects are good because uh, we need to get something out quickly. Um, they prioritize support of ho supportive housing and some they have a mix of supportive housing and typical affordable housing. So it's, it's good. We want to prioritize supportive housing and get a mix of as well with affordable housing. So I was pleased to see all that. The area of concern is that um, we are not abiding by our strategic implementation plan on homelessness, which is we wanted to decentralize housing and services from those areas in the city that we have historically uh, provided these types of this type of housing and services. For example, in Skid Row, there's several projects that have been proposed for Skid Row. Um, and uh, we wanted to, I uh, just want to make clear that our comprehensive strategic plan on homelessness, uh, it's very clear that we need to decentralize services and have a better and wider geographic distribution as to which projects we are selecting. Um, so my question is, on the guidelines, uh, do we need that in the guidelines as well? Or if we have it in our strategic implementation plan, do we just leave it there and we are aware of it? And does the oversight committee, are they aware of it when they're looking at these projects? So how does this get through that that is the policy that the council has approved? So I think that's one of the reasons we're adding the bonus points for for service, for facilities that come forward and can prove that they're in areas that lack services. I think on the issue of Skid Row, I think, um, I think it's key to point that out that we're not adding facilities. One facility is building a new facility as part of the housing development. So the clinic is, at, is already in Skid Row. They're just building a new clinic mm -hmm. that will be part of the housing development. And the other clinic, again, is already in Skid Row. They're just expanding because they need the expansion to meet the needs of their clients. The other project is a rehab project. Um, so again, the, the units are already there, and that's for transitional housing, and they're basically rehabbing the facility. Um, so I think that's one thing to point out, that we're not adding services, but they're improving the facilities and, you know, and or expanding the facilities to meet the needs of their clients. Uh, and to your, uh, to your question relative to housing, the Citizens Oversight Committee brought that up as well and, and share your concerns. Um, I think what you have before you now, the nine projects are pretty well uh, dispersed throughout the city and actually the demographics of the people we're going to be serving are, are pretty diverse as well. So it's, it's a, a nice blend. On a go forward basis, it's always a challenge to, you know, based on pricing to be able to concentrate certain areas of the city. We want to make sure that we're having distribution as wide as possible. I think certainly having the city assets uh, that we're going to be developing will, will help to that, uh, to that end as well. We want to encourage developers to bring projects forward that are throughout the city, not just in the downtown Skid Row area. It, it doesn't uh, uh, help the city as a whole if they're all concentrated in one area. So we certainly agree with you on that. At the same time, uh, as we are evaluating, at least as of right now, we're looking for every project that meets the, the threshold, we want to get out the door as quickly as possible. We will continue to look at ways to be able to emphasize other areas of the city in which we can build, though. Okay. So I think the comparison we have to make is not the comparison within the package itself, but historically. I mean, we have to look at it as a his in the historical context of the city and where the other beds and services are uh, in totality, not just each package. So I think uh, that's something we need to look at. Uh, I was a bit um, concerned initially when I saw the initial proposals, but uh, I understand many of those projects that were proposed for Skid Row had been in the pipeline already, Correct. seeking funding. HHH came available, so let's complete those projects. That made sense to me. However, there's one project that didn't make sense to me, and, and it's worthy of a policy discussion, and that is uh, the VOA project. Um, it doesn't actually create additional housing units. We're just rehabilitating existing units. Now, was that the intention of HHH? Our intention was to create 10,000 additional units of permanent supportive housing and or other additional units. So why are we investing in just rehabilitating when there's a great need to get new units on, on the street? 
Well, there's a, there's a couple of things there. This does create new bridge housing units. So this is a new, um, it's it's a type of service that will move um, each, each unit they're anticipating will move at least three people through in a year to permanent housing. Um, the, the rehabilitation question is, is really. So, mm. so this project is really bridge housing, not transitional housing? Yeah. Okay, all right, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, and as far as the rehabilitation goes, that, that's, it's a great question. I think part of the thing we're seeing, we saw with a lot of the facilities, because there's never been capital funding for these types of facilities at this, in this amount, especially before, there are a lot of, of homeless services and transitional housing facilities out there that have not, that have a lot of rehabilitation needs because they've been in service for a very long time and have not had sufficient funding to uh, maintain or upgrade systems and, yeah. and housing. And so it's definitely something that we saw a lot of applications where it was, it, there was a lot for, for rehab and just improvements yeah. in bringing things up to different standards. And, and I get that. I just think there's such a huge need to provide Absolutely. additional space and we got to prioritize that somehow in the mm -hmm. guidelines. Um, and I would assume that somehow, you know, look, we are going to end, and it's, it's a good point to make. I think at the end of the day, we will provide and see more projects that need rehabilitation. Um, they're falling apart. But I think if we could prioritize additional units, I, I think that's a, a question we all need to ask ourselves if we are going to prioritize that when we see applications coming in, right. right? Right. I think the particular benefit of this project as bridge housing, as something that is now they're dedicated for homeless veterans, service enriched, and designed to take advantage of a lot of the HUD, like the HUD bash vouchers that are out there for permanent yeah. housing for homeless veterans. Well, well, the description says it will increase the facilities clients served from 50 to a total of 75 veterans annually. Does that mean it already ser it's already serving 50 and we're expanding it by 25, or are we serving up to 75 new individuals? Well, the project has 46 total units. They've rehabilitated 24 of them already. This will rehabilitate the other 22. It's currently just SRO housing. This mm -hmm. re transitions it to bridge housing, which again has that the goal of moving people from these this bridge unit situation with the supportive services into a permanent housing, a permanent housing. Yeah. So, and this project scored fairly high. So that that begs the question: Are we using criteria to prioritize new additional? Uh, spaces versus rehabilitation because it scored high. So I'm wondering what criteria do we use then? So, I mean, we should stress that I think you said housing and because it's bridge housing or transitional, either way you want to call it, you we're trying to transition to permanent housing. Mm -hmm. It's considered a facility. So I think that on the housing side, I'm sure they're prioritizing new construction, but because this facility would actually, with the rehab, be able to serve more clients and then and, are, and would be able to move them to permanent housing. So it's going from, you know, being a facility to folks then moving to the units that HCID would be financing. So I think it's just important to stress that because it's bridge or transitional, it's considered a facility, not permanent supportive housing. Okay. Well, yeah, let me just say that I, I know that um, the VOA is a responsible operator and uh, I'm confident they'll do a good job in what they do, but, um, you know, it's just something for us to consider in the future. Um, they scored very high, yet it's not providing many new units, and we just have to look at that for the future. Yeah. Um, and, and to the chairs of this committee, I, I did want to request um, at some point, I know this has a, two parts of today's uh, item. Number one, one is to approve the projects. The other is to approve the guidelines for the next round. But I, I think we need some more time to look at the guidelines um, and learn from this experience. I know our CAO mentioned that we want to learn from our department staff on what was learned, et cetera. But I think we need to talk to some of the applicants as well. And I don't think we've done that to see what their experience was like and to still go around and have more vetting of the guidelines with the stakeholders involved. My question is, though, if we do hold this, and continue the, the guidelines for the next round, to get more input, um, you said you wanted to go out with the next request in July. Would that hold? Would that um, interfere with that timeline? Um, it it would if you couldn't hear it again before you you recess for you, you know go mm -hmm. to summer recess. But yeah. um, again, we could 
delay it by, you know, a month or so, an issue yeah. in August, yeah. so we could adjust well, the, the wanna, time frame. Yeah, I wouldn't want to delay the issuance, but if we could hear this again before then, it, it, I just think that these guidelines really haven't been cooked up as well as we would like and get as much input as we, we would like so we could really be clear on. I just brought up one example about rehabilitation versus new, new, new units, but those types of things need to be better laid out. But, it, you know, but again, I want to stress that it, facilities, um, we're not really considering them new units because it, no, I, they're I just... That was right, just one example. Right, I, I, you know, th those and, and if you look at the clear. amount of money, I think we're uh, 200 recommended 200,000. Yes. Yeah. And, they're, and, and, they, and they're bringing a large leverage. Yeah. And that's one of yeah, the reasons. I get that. But well. it's the guidelines that we need to clear up a little bit more. Anyway, if we can, uh, to the chairs of the committee, I, I think um, I'd like to request that at some point if it makes sense and we don't delay the next round just have at the next meeting another review at the guidelines and see what that may, you know, get some more time and more input. Mm -hmm. So if you could, yes, I, don't, I mean, I don't think we have, we wouldn't have an issue with that at all. And um, if you could just then move the, the project expenditure plans, because then those, at least the project expenditure plans have to be approved for the first issuance. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. So, is this on? So look, I, I, we don't have a problem moving the expenditures. But I, I think the point is is well taken. Every every project is with merit and sound argument and taken by itself. Uh, you know, of course, we want to fund fund them and get money out uh, as quick as possible. But the point it has to be well taken. There is segregation in the city. There is concentration in the city of where homeless people are placed. And so this is the beginning, and we ought to start on the right path. And so arguing and focusing on why these are meritorious is fine, but it doesn't point us in the direction of how we're going to move away from the segregation that takes place. It's, it's, it's abundant in downtown. It's abundant in Skid Row. It's abundant in certain districts. And in others, it doesn't exist. And so the question is, what's the strategy and what's the path that takes us in a way where there's equitable distribution in the city of where homeless people live? And that needs to be addressed. That hasn't been responded to. Your points were well taken on why these projects are meritorious. But we can do this and spend all the money and continue to build in, in Skid Row and in, in the areas around downtown Los Angeles and the areas of, of South Los Angeles. And, and that is not uh, an objective that's, that's acceptable for us. And so we need uh, to hear clearly what's the path that takes us away from the segregation and the, and the concentration of homeless in a handful of districts in the city. So on the facility side, I think you heard we're um, recommending bonus points for projects that come in from outside areas of concentrated services, mm -hmm. and but where services are needed. I think on the other issue, it's a fair housing issue. So I'm going to turn it over to Rushmore, because I know they're working on the next fair housing assessment. And in order, if you want to prioritize areas for funding, we have to be able to justify that, you know, that, um, you know, how we approach funding projects in areas based on a fair housing analysis mm -hmm. that we can justify or else we will be sued. So I'll well, we're turn it over to Rushmore. Right. Know, exactly. That's, That's the problem. And, and actually, we're, we're underway with our assessment of fair housing right now. And uh, that should be completed probably by September, October timeframe. And within that uh, study, it will pretty much lay out where we need to invest in, in what parts of the city so we have connectivity uh, for services, housing, jobs. All the parts of the city of Los Angeles must be connected. So that would be the blueprint by which that we would follow if, with recommendations and how we would want to fund not only just HHH funding, but also uh, I, home funds or any other source mm -hmm. of money's linkage fee dollars w right. so that we can have equitable distribution. Yes, Mr. Kretz. Yeah, I have a few questions and comments, but why don't I start where you left off? Uh, mm -hmm. So I have a largely affluent district um, without a lot of city properties. Um, and we tried in one of the most likely properties, uh, one of the few really downtrodden uh, properties in our district on La Cienega, what used to be a, a, a house of prostitution. Um, that pretty much uh, over the years became uh, uh, handled, so it was only a flea bag motel. Um, in recent years, it's been boarded up. 
So most likely place in the entire district to, to do it. Um, and uh, we got $500,000 from the Caruso project, which uh, could be targeted to that. And yet we weren't able to make that happen. If we can't make that happen with HHH dollars and we wanted to uh, ideally make it a, a, a veterans project where, where uh, we might even be able to, to come up with some federal dollars, it just didn't happen. So if it can't happen there, I can't imagine we're going to do much of, of, if any, HHH funded housing in my district. So how do we make that site and the few others that might be viable happen? Um, we're obviously not going to take um, market rate housing in Bel Air or some other part that's uh, incredibly expensive, but there that's most of my district anyway is, is high priced and not viable. So how do we make the sites that are even remotely viable happen? Well, first of all, to answer your question, it, it requires the will, the will of the, the accounts person, the will of the elected body, the will of, of the community, and the will of the, of the individual <coughs> or party that owns that property, if they're willing to sell or they're willing to bring in organizations to uh, remediate or build um, and provide those services. The, uh, the beauty of the dollars that we have uh, at our disposal uh, enable us to be able to leverage at a higher amount potentially if other sources uh, are, aren't sufficient to be able to meet the funding gap. So as an example, as uh, Yolanda mentioned, they have a, a cap right now on the facilities. Our initial proposal was is right now $12 million uh, per project. Uh, based, that's based on historically what we've seen projects come in at. Um, you may have a one-off here and there, but so far that's proven to be a, a good price point. That doesn't necessarily mean in the future that we can't necessarily revisit that and look at more expensive projects. Now, that, keep in mind that will obviously when you're looking at more affluent areas, we can work with the council office. The council office, if, if the, the council person is supportive of this, uh, and we can sit down with that property owner and come up with some form of a, a uh, an agreement, and they can apply. And they meet the, the thresholds that uh, I articulated earlier that are in the in the the guidelines right now. There's certainly it's doable. It's just you know you have to have the will of, of several parties, and we can create the policy that will enable us to get to, to that price point. The danger you run into is when you have a higher end. We just, you just, we want to make sure that we caveat the the higher price, the higher commitment that we are going to give them as far as subsidy is tied to the value of those properties or, or some nexus there. Because if you set the the higher amount across the board, then you're going to have every project coming in for that same dollar amount. So we, there are so there means we do. What do you, what do, you do with the uncooperative property owner? Because in my district, everybody has wild visions of what their property is worth. And I think the property owner here, even though it's uh, an area where just about every commercial property is a uh, single story, is envisioning a, you know, a 20 story building and, and making millions of dollars that'll uh, never happen and it, the zoning won't meet it. It's completely impractical, but that's their vision. Do right. we have any any anything at our disposal these days that would allow us to pay a, a fair rate and take that property. Well, I guess it comes down to what you said is, is fair, what they deem to be fair. And I'll give you an example, uh, working with the, the chair of the housing committee. He made resources available for the department to go try to purchase expiring former redevelopment agency covenants that were in market rate housing. And these were n not mission-driven organizations. These were just private developers who had been pursued some years back to have covenants in those buildings. When we went to pursue uh, potentially buying those covenants, there really was little interest uh, to have those covenants extended for 55 years because that was the source of monies we have. Um, so there, but with these dollars, we don't necessarily have to go to 55 years, but that has been the, the, the requirement that we've set for now. So there, there's different ways we can mix and match. It's, you're just going to pay a, a heftier price. And to be able to come up with a price point that stands the smell test across the city, there ha it really is, it's, it's a policy decision and we can, we can explore policies that would look at more affluent areas, but you know, you've got to remember 
if you're dealing with somebody that has a grand a grand vision of their property being valued at some a significantly higher amount than what the fair market value is then they're uh, unless they're they're violating some sort of land use or, or some have some sort of code violations there's really little the city has other than looking into its his pockets and coming up with more money and I, I like to be able to participate in in this program so obviously as closely as you can work with us to find opportunities well, and, and, it, and it, it addresses uh councilman weezer's uh concerns as well as you know certainly the citizens oversight committee and and, and councilman uh Cedillo. It, it, we want to make sure that we have a program uh that is uh utilized and and resources are allocated throughout the entire city and we understand there's different price points throughout the city as well it's it's getting the individual property owners to participate as well a, a within a reasonableness test of uh, of value okay and uh, i may be off but my recollection uh, originally when we were talking about hhh was that uh, 80 percent of uh, the units that were created were going to go to the homeless and i guess now we're talking about 50 percent and i'm not sure even if the requirement is 50 percent why we would want to uh, be using such a low number especially with the number of homeless rising so dramatically in the city so what what is the real number from the ballot initiative was it 80 or 50 and would we want to mm -hmm. why would we want to go lower so the the bond language says that up to 80 percent of the proceeds should go to supportive units um, and facilities so there was no um, uh, I should say break out between homeless unit and, and facilities and that up to 20% could be used for affordable units for people at risk of being homeless. I think the 50% you're, you're um, alluding to is that under the tax credit regulations, that's a definition of a supportive housing project. So in order to get funding under tax credits for supportive housing, 50% of the units have to be supportive and 50% of those have to go to the chronically homeless. I was also gonna comment on your issue with siting because I think we, we have that issue not only with housing but with facilities. And the other way we can try to solve that is by using city land, which we are you know, working on. And Mr. Bonner is very familiar with some of the projects that, and sort of the, and the challenges that we've had with that. But I wanted to stress that I think the other thing that we need, and maybe it's outside the city, is groups that will help us organize to get support from the community prior to identifying the site or making the site public. Um, I think that's a big challenge. But there are groups, including the United Way, who are working on a program to help us on with siting, because that's gonna be a continued challenge, and not only in your district, but I think in every district in the city. Oh, I'm sure we'll get objections, but yeah. we're not even at that right. point. Exactly. We're just trying to find exactly. projects, and, and I don't think it'll be that easy. And I, I certainly want to see us focus on getting to 80% and, mm -hmm. and uh, truly primarily serving the homeless. And I don't know if that, when you say facilities, if that includes storage facilities, it, it includes um, we that. obviously are in desperate need of that. Uh, mm -hmm. shelters, shelters, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if if uh, uh, I know a lot of the need that that I have is close to the freeway, so the the, the 405. So if we might look in that area, or I don't know uh, if there's some way for Mike and I to share one somewhere near the, the West LA City Hall facility. Um, Th thank you for offering a site in CD11. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that, that would happen to serve both of ours sort of near the boundary. If we could, fi if we could find one uh, on our side of the 405, I'd be happy to do that too. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we have any uh, city-owned facilities, but either way, I think it would, it would serve both of our districts on that, in that area. So I'm happy to look at anything in that direction. Anything else? No, that's it. Um, um, Mr. Uh, Senator Price next, I, let me add in that the um, there's an abundance of city properties uh, throughout the city. I don't think, it's it's probably one of the areas that is just evenly distributed throughout the city uh, where we park vehicles and a whole range of other activity takes place. DWP has properties throughout uh, um, 
the city. And then there's properties of other uh, entities like LAUSD, Metro, et cetera, for which we could do swaps. And so I think we need to think about that in terms of, of mapping out uh, the city and finding equity in terms of placement of, of new housing for, for homeless, uh, because that does exist. And, and there's value in that. And I think we need to start uh, attaching dollar amounts to it so that we can add that to the, uh, to the discussion in the mix. Mr. Bryce. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and, and thanks for this report. This is exciting uh, development as we as we start to move forward. And um, I am um, I'm I'm glad that uh, that we have an initial uh, looks like seven or eight projects coming out the gate. But I, I do share with my colleagues the concern that we have a concentration, a geographic concentration in some parts of uh, the city. So we want to see some some more diversity there. Um, and on the covenants, as you just my colleague was talking about, I know we've got that issue in, in nine. And so it's not only in affluent areas where we have difficulty buying the covenants back. Sometimes uh, property owners, wherever they are, choose you know not to, to re-up. And so it is a uh, challenge. I'm glad that we are focusing on it early. I know that we have a triage system that kind of goes out a couple years in advance. And I think that's, that's definitely helpful. Uh, but on this project, um, the uh, the number come is, looks like something around $400, $400 a door. Is that $400,000 a door? Is that the roughly rule of thumb? Is that pretty average for uh, affordable? Uh, what's it, it has been. I'm, I'm going to just hand this over to uh, Mr. Yeah. Gibson. He, uh, he manages uh, our major project section and, and give you a better sense of the pricing. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Ed Gibson, Director of Development and Finance. 425 a door is probably going to be one of the lower numbers you're going to see. Um, it's it's averaging about out like that, but it also has a great deal to deal with people and their holding costs and how long it takes them to assemble the financing and put the parcels together. So when you look at the the list of projects there, you see stuff down low at the, right. in the 300s and you see stuff up in, up in the fives, yeah. and it all has to do with where that you know land in LA, where that land was. How did you get it assembled, and how long did you have to hold it, and what did you actually have to pay for it? And so we're, we're seeing that range across. And then you add on top of that um, the construction cost increases that we've seen over the last year, year and a half. Um, we've seen great cost increases going up with competition for labor. And so that's varying across the spectrum and impacting the cost of units as well. So, But these budgets uh, reflect um, fully funding or or with the action that we're going to take, they'll get a letter to go get the rest of the funding they need to complete the project. This first batch, if someone does need additional funding, they should probably have it already in hand. This first batch is expected that we plugged, we used the extra 80000 supplemental mm -hmm. to plug basically the remaining gap that they had left so that they would be able to start construction um, by no later than June 30th of next year. And so they shouldn't be chasing other funding other than their tax credits. So we're basically saying, okay, if this is the last thing left and we need to plug this gap, then we'll plug it, get in the ground, and start building. Because we all know it's going to take a year, a year and a half for you to construct it before somebody can occupy it. So if that's your only hold up, we f So is that one of our requirements, though, that, that uh, there be a, a, a gap that we're filling that will – Completed or one of the requirements was the per unit cost, but one of the requirements for this very first expedited funding was that you were able to start construction by June thirtieth of next year. So people still have to go through the tax credit process and particularly on the four percent side, and that takes that just literally takes time. So it's an application process to the state. Um, council sees it because we do the TEFRA motions that come through council. And so that has, you know, a hundred, hundred and fifty day worth of time involved. It's just the, the nature of it from beginning to end. And so if you can get from here to there, if we give you this money, that's what we're expecting. We have inside this right now, if you take a look um, at the first three projects on, on the list, they're at some stage of the very closest. Two are basically going for SIDLAC um, funding, which is the 4% side. Um, if their application is not in, they're going in r right away. So they'll have probably a closing by the end of this year, and the other one is uh, expected to go to 9% tax credits at the end of June here. So as we fund those, those will be the first ones along. And so as we move forward here, 
long as we keep on a pace, we, we will see them. So these, this first batch is expedited. In the future, we plan to plug the pipeline. We intend to give them two-year letters of commitment because we know it takes time to assemble the other leveraging financing as other county or state programs come online to start funding. Right now there's a shortage of those. That time should collapse, and particularly with efforts from planning to expedite affordable housing and permanent supportive housing entitlements, that gap will shorten up and hopefully it'll help limit some of the carrying costs associated with um, affordable housing projects. But we also know we'll And the count. fact that some of these projects may or may not have uh, um, supportive services, is that a, a requirement? To, All of them will have they permanent. They have supportive services as part of the requirement. All of them will have. So in order to meet the definition of a permanent supportive housing, 50% of the units must be for permanent supportive housing. Our requirement is of 25 or half of those units must be for chronically homeless. So all those units will have permanent supportive housing services associated with them. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Bonner. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Chair in this case. Uh, several questions. One, I want to get some clarification first on the housing units. You said there were 650 in total? Correct. And 416 would be permanent supportive housing? Correct. Um, and 225 of, of, those. of those would be for chronically homeless? Correct. Okay, so my first question is about the permanent supportive housing. Um, and this may be a lack of my own knowledge here. Um, in my mind, permanent supportive housing usually is used for people who are chronically homeless and people who are episodically homeless or newly homeless are less likely to need, need PSH, that they might be uh, uh, better served by a, a, a rapid rehousing voucher or, or something like that. Wh who are the potentially 200 non-chronically homeless people that would be in need of permanent supportive housing? I'm just trying to get a sense of who that population is. Well, the definition of the chronic homeless is they've been uh, homeless for six months or they've had, a, a, over the series of one year, I think, homeless three times. Uh, you can still be homeless, though, and not necessarily be uh, chronic. Yeah. So, I mean, th that the, I, the, the design was to be able to address uh, a range of low-income homeless and then, of course, the most acute, so you can have the level of service, wraparound services for those that are in most need. Although th those that are not even chronic, they will certainly have the wraparound services as well. So you're trying to cr create a blend uh, uh, within within each of the, the housing uh, I get that. What project. I'm saying, though, is, is, is the folks who have not yet become chronically homeless? Uh, th uh, that could be your low income. Um, and you, you actually, then your your 50% could, that could be people that are, I, are homeless. I, 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 yeah. I know, but... but there are going to be 200 units of permanent supportive housing for people who are not chronically homeless. They are, so are you saying that some of the PSH units might go to folks who aren't even homeless but might just be at risk of being homeless? No. They're, They're all homeless, okay. So if they are not chronically homeless, uh, they, they have been homeless for a shorter period of time, generally speaking. Um, what, what percentage of people who are homeless but not chronically homeless are in need of the extensive wraparound services of the PSH as opposed to the more minimal services provided by rapid rehousing? I can't answer the exact percentage, but permanent supportive housing is basically housing that wraps the services around the needs of the clientele. But we know we have several types of needs of clientele. There's a group who are chronically homeless who've been homeless for over a year or for a very extended period of time and a number of times. They have traditionally been the hardest to serve. We have homeless who've been homeless for a while. They're not considered chronic. Maybe they've gone in and out. But what they need is some type of service to keep them from falling back to becoming homeless, which is how you see the No Place Like Home, formerly known as the Mental Health Services Act, Housing Dollars, which was targeting that group and the chronically homeless. So. They've, they've always been a mix, and that's and it's dressed to wrap around the services. Why? What you've also seen is the chronically homeless are also the most challenging and most intense to also provide services for. So you couldn't necessarily have an entire building of that. I think that would be also a, a very big challenge. So you have a mix of populations when you look at these 
buildings across the line. But I, 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 I understand. I totally understand the yeah. mix, the, the need for yeah. a mix of yeah. population. But they're all need of permanent and, and, support and of. Th that's the part I'm not quite wrapping my head around is why folks who have a less intense need have an equal need for the intense services. Well, they, the services are adjusted for the need of the clientele. So if, if you're chronic, clearly you're going to get the most highest service. Yeah. If you're not chronic, but you need a lighter service, but you still need permits for it, that's the level they're gonna get you, because it's customized for whatever those people are needing. What we've had historically, maybe that's what, maybe this gets to what your point. What we've had historically is a challenge finding those who are prepared to deal with the most chronically homeless. Um, we've, we've had some who've done a great deal of work in that way, but that's been the very difficult target. They've done a lot of permanent supportive housing, but not necessarily for the most chronically of chronically. And we've seen that. Yeah. So that I mean, focus has been intense. I, I've probably complained but. more than most that we've had too much of, too, too exclusive a focus on chronic homelessness for too long. And as a result, we have let people who are episodically homeless become chronically homeless before we can I, help them. Yeah. That's, I, I, I get I, that. What I'm just wondering though is, given that we have more than 225 people who are chronically homeless, if we have a permanent supportive housing unit available, I is that for some of that population more than they need when there is someone who actually has that need that is going unmet? I, I, I kind of get what you're saying. I don't know if it will be divided like that. So if half, a, if half a building, let's just say 50 units are permanent supportive housing, of which we've designated a minimum must be for the chronically homeless. So you know at any, at any one moment in time, you will not be less than that many chronically homeless inside the building. It's not to say that you can't have more chronically homeless in the building. It's just that we want to make sure that that population gets served as well at a minimum. And when they're there, they will get those intensive services. It isn't that I'm in this room, and if I'm in this room, I only get the most intense services. It's you get the services you need, but when when that room is, that unit is filled by coordinated entry, it is filled by a person who meets the chronic homeless definition, and then the services come. I, it, I it's not tied that. to I a just, physical unit like I, that. I, I'm not entirely convinced that we're matching people with the right resources, just intuitively. I could In coordinated you. entry, you mean, or? or? Th th through this, th oh. through the fact that you're putting non-chronically homeless people in, in PSH. Let me ask the other side of the 650 yeah, question. Yeah. Can I clarify a point on that? Yeah. But even if they're non chronic, there's some demographics, like families, right? Yeah. That take priority, even if they're chronic or non chronic. The, the, will those numbers? It, it depends on the unit. There are people who need permanent supportive housing, and has been this historically, that aren't chronically homeless. And the goal is to keep them from becoming chronically homeless by providing the permanent supportive housing I, I guess that. What I'm okay. wondering, though, is if there is a unit for them that doesn't cost $430,000. No. Uh, <laughs> be, well, be, no, be, I, I disagree with that. Yeah. Because there are families that I know that can a rapid rehousing voucher. And the minimal, more, the smaller amount of services is what they need. So, but, but let me it, go to the next. Let me, that would let me be go a different the, population let, by far. Let, I get you now. Let, Sorry. Let me go to the next part. That would be a different population, not this. 615 units, mm -hmm. 416 of them are permanent supportive housing. What are the other 199? The, they're at risk of homelessness. So it's affordable housing? Uh, no, it's at risk of homelessness. It's a little bit higher definition. So what you have in a lot of permanent supportive housing projects, and maybe we should have that conversation, but um, you, have a, you have a portion that will be chronically homeless. You will be the, the permanent supportive housing. And then you have those who do not fit the hard definition of permanent supportive housing, which is we know people who are going to need a voucher and some other things. But they may need some type of service that may be light or at risk of homelessness. And so in most permanent supportive housing projects, you see a number of units always held back for this, for this population because they don't meet the firm definitions, but they need some type of support. So in this particular instance, those units, if, if funded, are for those at risk, at risk of homelessness per the requirements of HHH. Not to exceed 20% of, of the population. 199 units, are they going to someone who is sleeping in their vehicle? or are they going to someone who currently has a roof over their head? 
they should be going to someone who's considered at risk of homelessness in the sense, I don't know where they're gonna come from. They're gonna come through either the coordinated entry system or similar like system if they're, if they're services. But if, if you were sleeping in your car and, and, and you were able to get into the, yes, you would qualify because you're homeless and sleeping in your car for the non-PSH units, assuming you don't need permanent supportive housing. Is that fair? Yeah, just I'm concerned because this is 30% that is going for people who are not yeah, go ahead. Again, we're, we're HHH allows us to uh, has the strict parameters of uh, permanent supportive housing, of which a portion is for chronically homeless, and up to twenty percent can be used for those who are at risk of homelessness. Twenty percent. Up is, to twenty percent. And this is thirty percent. No, up to I apologize. Up to twenty percent of the funds. Up to 20% of the funding. It's not by units, everybody. It's by the funding. So the funding allocation we're doing, and how does the funding break down? So on a non-PSH unit that's at risk of homelessness, and it was a 4% transaction, the actual PSH unit is $140,000 a door, up to $140,000. So we don't want to fund this high every single time. On a non-PSH at risk of homelessness, in the current guidelines, it's up to $100,000 a door, bringing it back down to yeah. traditional levels. No, I, I, I was calculating the 20 the, the twenty percent based on the number of units. Yeah, you, you said it's not the number of units. It's based on the bond size. Dollars. What yeah. percentage of the dollars here is for homeless and what percentage of the dollars is for not yet homeless? Is it less than 20%? Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. My apologies. Um, but since it's off the entire bond series and we will track it as, as such, um, we will make sure we do not exceed that in a number of other um, – financing parameters that we have to be held to. Uh, let me move over to the facility section. Uh, so 5% um, cap, 15% requirement of contribution. Are those part of the same guidelines? Would th those be part of the same guidelines that we're going to do additional consideration for that Mr. Wezar is referring to? Yes. Okay. Uh, those concern me. 15% contribution in particular concerns me. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've always felt that the this type of stuff gets short, sh short shrift generally. And I'm thinking, you know, if I weren't trying to offer up a facility for storage in Venice, the group that had been trying for a very long time to do it on a volunteer basis, an hour a day was Venice Community Housing. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted to, to come in after eight years of doing it for free, I wouldn't want to tell them they have to go out and come up with 15% before we'll, we'll do our part. So that mm -hmm. concerned me a bit. Um, I, I also have some concerns with the, the, the LASA letter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not entirely sure that that should be a requirement. Did I hear it? Is, is that so, something that would be good to have, or is that a requirement? We would require a letter from a service funder. So because we can't fund the services, yep. we need some some letter of good standing from their service from whoever is funding the services to be able to to know that that this this facility will be able to provide the services for the useful life of the project. Give us some indication that the service is stable and will be able to maintain for the useful life of the project. If LASA is one of their service funders, we would ask for that letter from LASA. If LASA is not one of their service funders, then some service funder needs to provide a letter of good standing. And, and the, the fact that if LASA is one of many funders, LASA has to be the letter, that's the part that concerns me. Okay. Uh, just, uh, I, I'm not convinced yet that LASA has made sort of the paradigm shift that we're requiring of them in the comprehensive homelessness strategy. So I, I just want to be sensitive to, to that. I wanted to comment on the leverage, that it really depends how we count the leverage, right? So if someone maybe brings their own facility and they need rehab for the facility, I mean, there's no reason why we wouldn't count that facility, right? right? If they only need, say, to add showers. So I guess I think it depends how we define leverage, so we can come back and yeah. maybe define think of that. Uh, define that. And the, my final point is, um, uh, you know, I agree with the points all my colleagues have made about the, the, the continued concentration. Uh, I think 
some work needs to be done about Mr. Wiesar's point about building in dispersal into the guidelines. I mean, if you look at this map, it is mostly um, 8, 9, 13, and 14. If you were going to ask me what were the four council districts that are likely have it, those would be it. Now, if you add in the, the housing opportunity sites, then you add in CD1 and CD11, which would be the two others I would imagine you would put. Um, you, you need to, to get, we need to get other stuff on here. Um, so I totally get Mr. Koretz's questions because it's very hard to do the stuff with the land values in, in our district. But city property is, is the way to do it. So um, wh when or, or where will we start seeing city properties factored into this? Or are city properties and Triple H always going to be separate? mentioned earlier, Councilman, we, we are already looking at 44 parcels right now. Uh, once we enter into a development agreement with them, then they will apply uh, to uh, receive HHH funds or go through our, our pipeline. So they'll, at that point, they'll be positioned, and of course, the value of the property going into it makes it obviously uh, cheaper, and we can get to areas of the city we don't typically get to. Okay. As a sort of corollary to that, now that I have come out and put some city-owned properties in my district, some folks who are not as uh, intent on maximizing profit for the properties they own, the 20-story tower uh, that Mr. Fred talked about, are now starting to come forward and saying, well, I might be interested in doing so. What's the best way to engage them with the process? Well, there's um – Because they're, they're, they're clueless. They've never done mm -hmm. this before. Right. But they're like, I get this is a problem. Right. I own a bunch of properties. I might be willing to do something. Or I might be willing to purchase something and let right. you use it. Well, it, the uh, the municipal facilities committee is the one that ultimately will make the recommendation. Uh, I would recommend to all the council offices to sit down with the CAO's office and or yeah. right, yeah, or, it's private properties. Yeah. Oh, but then the, certainly you could reach out to us, councilman, and we could come and, and speak with you know, representative of your office and and the the, the property owner and uh, go over what what, the, what options they may have. We'd okay. be more than happy to have that discussion. All right. Um, just, you know, on city-owned properties, we're continuing to identify additional properties, and to, Ms. And to Councilman Zadio's point, we're actually meeting with LA Unified, because they're actually very interested yeah. in using some of their land for housing. So we're meeting with them in the next two weeks, and Metro as well. I, I know Mr. Zimmer was. He won't be there for right. more than a few weeks. So meet, <laughs> meet, meet tomorrow. Get it done. <laughs> Get it done. Meet tomorrow. Um, and the, 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 my urge on that is get more properties out sooner. Yeah. You know, Every community has a map like this. Right. So, you know, the folks in Venice have a map that shows all of the uh, city properties just on the west side, and they say, oh, they're all in Venice. You know, they don't look at the map that shows where the existing ones are or the map that shows where these are. And so it would be good to also have an overlay map of yeah. what's existing, what's proposed from this, what's proposed from the other uh, the opportunity sites. Yeah. Final one, though, is when are we going to start seeing – hotels, abandoned hospitals, other buildings that can be um, uh, quickly or more quickly rehabbed than starting something from scratch. How do we get those in the pipeline? So let me turn over to Ed because he has a lot of A lot of this process gets caught up in the entitlement issue, not necessarily the financing issue. So with, with regards to motels, there's been a lot of conversations about motels, a lot of conversation about zoning, owners. So for those who want to sell, um, the conversation can go rather quickly. A good number don't want to sell, and that's what's slowing things down. And so um, the, the sources of money, say 55-year covenants, and that makes it a, a non-starter right there. So that's a very big challenge. If you're a motel owner and you are interested in providing, selling your property or, or entering into a, an agreement to do this, um, you reach out either to us, to an uh, affordable housing developer, and we'll take you through the process and explain how it is. Uh, in a, you can uh, – I sit on the city attorney's panels, so part of that as well. So with that said, you could go to the city attorney, but if it's going to become technical, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to me. Exactly. And so we will, we will literally walk through your property because everything is – is very unique. I can give you a holistic view that 
uh, a great deal of interest in people perhaps uh, interested in leasing out their properties and and that path will go a little bit different way it'll go through the county and they'll be using um, their flexible uh, master leasing, master leasing flexible. their property and going through brilliant brilliant corners mm -hmm. and so that's one path those who want to actually convert it uh, in permanent stuff that will come that will come to us. So at this particular date, there's there's a couple of there's more interest in the in the the leasing for a period of time than there is con converting. Okay. Um, but a lot of work, a lot of work has has gone into trying to work through these various issues, because whether it's tax credit financing or master lease, this stuff gets so complicated okay. so quickly with everybody's rules. Um, you will see a lot of lawyers in a room. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember um, Councilmember Harris Dawson. Thank you so uh, much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all my colleagues. I think you raised a lot of the important points that we're very, very concerned about uh, as we get uh, going on this project. I want to start out by complimenting all of you for bringing forward these projects uh, and getting them done in a quick manner uh, so we can have human beings with shovels and pickaxes and whatever else you use to build out very, very soon. Um, you know, when I go to community meetings, people are already saying, why aren't you building housing? And I have to remind them that they haven't paid the tax yet. Um, so <laughs> I think we can't start soon enough, <laughs> um, that we can't start soon enough because people are anxious to see something. And so I think this package represents that, uh, notwithstanding all the questions about geography that we're very, very concerned about. Uh, one, um, I have d two sort of things that I'd like for uh, you all to discuss. Um, and the first one has to do with the public education piece. So uh, I, I think that I appreciate the technicalities for why these units have to cost what they cost, okay? One of the, I just pulled up Zillow right here. I think Mr. Weezer might have been looking over my shoulder. One of these buildings in my district where, where it's about 440 a unit, you could literally walk two doors down and buy an apartment building, an entire apartment building, for less than the price of one unit uh, that we're building. So I just want to get some guidance. Yes, it's. I just want to get some guidance from you about how we explain this to people, uh, because it's just a very rough. And I know we've got some housing providers in the the room. I would in, in, invite their input as well. Uh, how we explain this to everyday people, because it's it's just a very tough, tough uh, thing to reconcile. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> it, it absolutely is. The, when we go to do financing, um, whether it's city, state, federal, money comes with a lot of rules and requirements of how things have to be handled, addressed, paid for. If you're buying, if you buy that apartment building, then anybody, everybody in it will have to be relocated, and that'll become an additional cost inside the project, and it'll cost as, as, as much. So you're going to add that to an, to an existing building, and then you're going to have to bring it up to a certain code in order for the next person to want to finance it. Then you're going to have the holding cost from the acquisition lender till the time you're able to bring down the construction. Then you're going to go through either a tax credits, or 9% or 4%, and that's going to provide a new legal structure, an equity partner, and everything. And every good. little okay. bit keeps yeah. adding a cost to it. And so, you know, sometimes inside the program, you see, like, there's a minimum dollar amount, like 500000 If If it's actually – you don't want to touch certain money if it's going to put too many rules on you and discourage you. We need to think about it a, a different way. And also in this – in our term sheet, we've provided a path for future thought about if you have a way not to do it with tax credits, come see us. Come see us. Let's take a look at that cost structure because we've left a path to absolutely talk to you to figure out how we can do this on a, at a cheaper cost. But at this moment in time, you're assembling funding sources from across the spectrum. So acquisition costs, then you're holding it, then you're getting your next funding, lawyers, bonds, Entitlement fees, all those things add up, and you end up with these numbers. And so we do our best to put, you know, loan amount limits, upper caps in there, because we don't, we want to be reasonable, but we don't want the costs inflated just to do to get the maximum amount of money. So we're trying to be balanced on both sides. And so following up on that, uh, again, not being an expert on this, but I would imagine that the more you do, the cheaper it gets per unit. 
yes and no. Yes and no. On a permanent support of housing project, so you can get some economies of scales, but on a permanent support of housing project, it's it it's starting to generate technically less income overall because the population doesn't have income. So you're going to need more Section 8 or some other type of operating subsidy inside of it. So as it starts to get bigger, the gap starts to get to get very, very large. And so you will move from a 4% transaction if you can't get all those subsidies built up together, the 4 or 5 you're going to need. You're going to move to a 9% because it's going to help plug, plug the gap sooner. And then if you go 9%, then, then it gap will shrink and then you're able to put in the money but you're still going to need the vouchers economies of scale is key Gen and part of that is entitlement mention four percent and nine percent transactions is probably not the answer we're looking for for our constituents yeah yeah, yeah. well entitlements is going to where i was going is entitlements is going to be key because right now we have people um because of the way the process is and planning is working on it there's they're sitting around the 49 49 unit range so as planning works through their affordable housing and other entitlement processes, it will help be able to build, build the appropriate density on the appropriate site, thus helping to lower the cost as well. Is that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess what I was getting at, I'm, I have curiosity about the upper cap. Uh, it seems like you'd want to do larger. It seems like you wouldn't want to have a cap uh, no. because you'd save money. Right. And, and so can I just, it just, it just money. a point on the cost per unit, because I think it outlined, you know, all the regular, all the yeah. different monies, but I think one of the points you can make to your constituents, the city's not paying the entire cost for the unit, right? We're either paying a third or a fourth, so we're leveraging our money. So I think you, I think that's one way to at least say, look, these ha these are affordable, they have to remain affordable for 25 years, that's why you need all this public subsidy, but we're not paying the entire cost of the unit. We're paying a third or fourth and leveraging. So for every dollar we invest, we're leveraging three or four. And that may be helpful. How about the cap now? Yeah. So taking the, the pie in its entirety because it's a separated. So we're leveraging up against other uh, financial sources that are coming in, and which is why there's a 50% minimum permanent support of housing. If you're doing a tax credit deal and we're talking about, if you're doing a 4% deal, as the structure with 140, that's a 75 unit deal. If you're doing a 9% transaction way it's written, that's a 120 unit deal. Those are both very, very large projects. So the cap isn't coming into play at that particular moment in time. If you're doing a project that would go over 120 units, which most likely you're going to do 9% because the gap is getting very large, tax credits is going to limit you at 120 anyway. So your financing structure is unequivocally going to change. So when we see that, we see them broken into two projects. And so this is where we have to remain cognizant of the ways to manipulate the system. I'm going to break into two projects now. And now I can turn around and leverage two loans from you. So now I'm going to work to get, now I have two 12, per, 12, 12 million dollar caps, one per project, which means I can max up to 24 million dollars per project. I don't think you're being constrained when you do that. You're you're actually working the system. You're working the system. So we we keep several belts and suspenders around paying attention. One is that cap, one is the the per unit, and the other one's watching the total development cost to make sure people aren't inflating the total development cost to try to get to the other side as well. Excellent. Thank you. That that was helpful. Um, so, and then uh, last question. It's uh, probably a uh, it's a nuanced question. I think it's probably a nuanced answer. Nuanced answer. So. It seems to me we have this race to do the number of units per year and the total amount in 10 years. It also seems like we have this other goal to sort of break against the de facto apartheid, right? The class apartheid that we all live with in this country and in, certainly in this city, right? So what you have is the projects, that that goal of breaking the apartheid, mm -hmm. Take, those projects take longer. They cost more and they cost take more. longer. Exactly. Right? So every time you get, it seems like every time you get to the line, the ones in the areas where it's easy to site are going to be ready, and those other ones are going to have this barrier or this last barrier or this last barrier. I mean, one, they are complicated in general, and two, they have people well financed setting up things, right? Like making up things that, things that you have to jump over. So I'm just wondering how are you you balancing? I mean, even in my district, the the the, and I would say my district is 90 percent low income. Mm -hmm. Even in my district, the less low income areas, the deals take longer to build the will and get mm -hmm. the 
ownership, all of it. I mean, and so I can imagine in the city it's much more, much, much more challenging. Right. So how do you, how are you all thinking about balancing those two things out? Well, uh, and meeting the goals of the project. Well, it's interesting because uh, we've thought about this quite a bit, Councilman. And when HHH was passed, we were high fives, great. And they were thinking this is wonderful, great news. Amongst ourselves, we were thinking, well, okay, this is going to be interesting a year from now to see where we're actually able to build. Mm -hmm. People voted for it, but they want it in their backyard. And this is really, I'm, we're going to rely on this body and the council and the mayor's office to help us pursue areas of the city that we don't typically build. With that, it's going to cost us more as well, as you, as you clearly stated, Councilman, and, and our, as we discussed earlier about the construction costs, it is, they are absorbent. Um, and it's important that we have regular check-ins with this committee, as well as the Administrative Oversight Committee and the Citizens Oversight Committee, excuse me, so that they understand that when we're making these decisions, it's potentially eating into that ultimate goal. Now, as additional resources become available, we're, we're obviously going to pursue those and try to mitigate any kind of uh, huge sways in the amount of gap financing we need to provide in a project. Uh, but this is going to be a collective decision and a policy decision that uh, the city is going to make as it moves forward uh, to divvy up the money in an equitable fashion. But with that comes a price point. So we're all going to be in this decision-making process together and understand what the ramifications are as we move forward. E each and every year we, we uh, come before you with a uh, project expenditure plan, but even in the interim as we're reviewing projects bef to give them those conditional letters of commitment. So this is going to be a, a, a shared approach and, and shared understanding as we move forward. But we, we, we absolutely agree with you that we need to distribute these monies, but understand there will be implications. Just from the putting my homeless coordinator hat on and the strategy itself, I think that's where the planning strategies in the eights and some of the sevens are so are going to be really important as well. In addition to, as you've all pointed out, the city-owned properties, this the planning strategies that are designed that we should be seeing some of that stuff come forward very soon. The planning department is working on a permanent supportive housing ordinance, for example, to make some of those those. Um, requirements that do extend the term of the, the period of time it takes to build a project to take like they testified in the uh, citizens oversight committee last year last week <laughs> two weeks ago that the goal of the permanent I'm so tired the goal of the permanent supportive housing ordinance is to take that development period from three years to one year and when we've heard about how holding costs add to the costs of projects that will also help make the proposition HHH funding go that much farther I think that's the other part where it's not necessarily about financing guidelines but the other things that we can do to try and facilitate construction of housing and get get out of the way where we can okay let's um, hear from the public before we take an action Amy Anderson, thank you. Stay on H sit. Amy Anderson, uh, Stephanie Klasky Gamer. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, who is this? Hayes? Todd Hayes. Todd Hayes. So number one, I have Amy Anderson and I have Todd Hayes. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. Amy Anderson, Executive Director of PATH Ventures. Um, I'm here to simply urge you to support pa um, staff's recommendations um, uh, for the uh, HHH program. Um, I did want to um, urge the uh, committee to move forward with staff's recommendation, in particular for the Permanent Supportive Housing Loan Program. While um, there's probably some time to uh, evaluate the facilities program, it will be pretty critical to get commitments out for the supportive housing um, project so that we can go out and secure additional financing in the fall. So urging you to support um, all of those recommendations when it comes to the uh, permanent supportive housing um, programs. Um, I also just want to say congratulations because I think it's really important that we take the opportunity to recognize all the milestones related to Measure H, which was such um, a landmark resource for the city. So thanks. Congrats. Mr. Hayes? 
background, three years of Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. A city council meeting, uh, Nate Holden had to be physically restrained from attacking Mike Hernandez. Hernandez said, we are going to take over this city house by house, block by block, council district by council district. That seems to be holding true. The, the mayor said that if the illegal immigrants are being pounded on anymore, they're going to riot. Hmm? There was a housing project which was prominently uh, populated by Latinos. The three black ho uh, who lived there, their home was firebombed. Fortunately, LAPD seems to have uh, solved that problem. Two bodies cannot live in the same place at the same time. The housing problem is because poor people are displacing poor people. Latinos are displacing black people. That's the problem. Eventually, it's going to rise to an ultimate problem. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Stephanie Klasky Gamer with LA Family Housing. Um, I want to thank you for a very robust afternoon of discussion. <laughs> you guys took on a lot, and um, and we appreciate HSID staff and the CAO's office staff really addressing some of the hard issues as we're developing policies around the implementation and the funding of H dollars, including the high cost of our developments. And I hope that we'll be able to talk about that a little bit more with item number six as it comes up. Um, but I really came because I wanted to thank you. LA Family Housing South Campus, which provides bridge housing for more than 300 people annually, that is a service center and hub where LA Unified, DCFS, um, DPSS all work together under one roof, serving homeless families in a diverse region. We, base, we are based out of North Hollywood. So we're thrilled that this funding has been recommended for those kind of critical homeless facilities under the Triple H funds, and I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got a motion. So these are, is the language. Oh, I'd like to um, move the item and but uh, bifurcate and continue uh, the guidelines as were proposed for next year to uh, a time that would not impede the uh, planned uh, next round of RFPs or whatever you call them, <coughs> RFPs. Okay. Second, Mr. Second. Great. Any objection? John White, City Clerk, to clarify, uh, you're approving CAO recommendations one and two, except for recommendations two C and two D. Is that yes. That correct? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Hold on. What was that? You're approving one. The only thing we want to continue is the guidelines. That's all. Yes, we are. We also want well, I don't have that in front of me. Yeah. Just uh, right. Also, I want to move. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I want to um, uh, move that we r remove the suggested stuff for City Council review and the RFP implementation calendar. That is before the AOC and COC as that is uh, duplicative since now we have this implementation of a letter. Uh, council gets to review before uh, it goes, so there's no need for it to come back to us for consideration. So noted. Are we clear? Yes, sir. You're good. All right. All right. Uh, no objection? This will be the order on item one. <laughs> Let's put a six. Yes, Mr. Chair, item six, a motion requesting the city attorney with the assistance of Bureau of Contract Administration to prepare and present an ordinance to implement a citywide project labor agreement for projects funded with Proposition HHH. Okay, let's uh, hear public comment before we go to the... Um uh, discussion. Uh, Ron Miller. Sir, what are we doing? 
Ron Miller, Stephanie, and Amy, item six. Please join us. Uh, Amy Anderson, path. Good afternoon. I'm Ron Miller, Executive Secretary of the LA Orange County Building Trades. And first of all, I want to thank uh, all well, of you for. Ron. Let's let's get everybody shuffling. Oh, this time. Can we start this time over again. Good afternoon. I'm Ron Miller. I want to make sure we get that we start on the time. Go ahead, Ron. Thank you. Ron Miller with the Building Trades. I just want to thank each and every one of you for championing this motion to implement the uh, citywide project labor agreement. We think uh, our partnership with the city, between the city and the Building Trades, has been uh, a great thing. We've put many, many people from the community to work, Hom homelessness folks also, uh, with the disadvantage or transitional worker language that's in our agreements. It's been very valuable. I, uh, I would like you to move this forward as fast as possible so that we don't have another nine projects not carried under the agreement because I think we missed an opportunity there with the nine projects that were just pushed forward today. So again, thank you very much and I look forward to uh, a very cherished partnership with this department also. Thank you. Hi again, Stephanie Klasky Gamer with LA Family Housing. Um, we appreciate the, the public policy goals that are trying to be achieved with the new PLA, uh, with the proposed PLA being citywide. However, we would really sincerely and earnestly request that parameters be set on any citywide policy so that it doesn't negatively impact the affordable housing development. You previously addressed the high cost of affordable housing development and the pace at which it's done. When developments are done at 50 units and below, it's hard to take on the requirements that are currently proposed. We're asking that both projects that have currently received commitments of Triple H or managed pipeline or other HCID dollars not fall under this new ordinance. If you're increasing costs by 25% without new funding, we need to go out and, and leverage those dollars. So we will take longer to actually produce those units. Thank you. Hi, um, I would just second everything that uh, Stephanie had to say. There is a, a, a clear alignment, mission alignment between building um, affordable homes and permanent supportive homes and good jobs and well-paying jobs. Um, so we see, we see a benefit to pursuing this policy, um, but it does need to be balanced with a potential significant impact to the cost of the developments that um, affordable housing and permanent supportive housing developers are pursuing under HHH. So, uh, what's really important is for the affordable housing developers to have a seat at the table with the city attorney as the guidelines under this ordinance are being developed. We would really appreciate some kind of threshold. Uh, the redevelopment agency used a threshold of 75 units in a project as um, the threshold at which uh, a PLA would apply. We'd um, suggest that there be a, a similar threshold under this program. Thank, Thank you. you. Alan Greenlee and Mike Alvidrez. Where are you, sir? Good afternoon. Isha Jones, Isha Jones, Venice Community Housing. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Alan Greenlee. I'm the executive director of the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing. I want to say how excited I am about the work that you guys just did a couple of seconds ago where you passed that first first group of developments. It's so exciting to see that the fruit of the work uh, as we work collectively with the council 
to get HHH on the ballot is now starting to happen. So that's really great. Um, I submitted for the record a, um, a letter that talks about our um, improvements, suggested improvements to the project labor agreement. As Amy pointed out, we're completely on board with the notion that we can do the development of the supportive housing and provide good jobs. Um, but I think that specifically on the on the end of your conversation about cost, that we need to be really careful that we're maximizing the dollars that are being made available so that we meet the 10,000 unit goal um, that was uh, put before the voters. And I look forward to continuing to work with the council. And uh, I'll just say that we've already started some very robust and serious discussions with the building trades so that our community and that community can really start to work together. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mike Alvidris, uh, Skidra Housing Trust. I, I, I want to reiterate, uh, I think, what is general consensus in the supportive housing developer community that we can both uh, combat homelessness by building new permanent supportive housing and create good jobs in the city. Uh, and I think those are two worthy and goals worth design. pursuing. I'm sorry? And quality design. And quality design at the same time, like the one we did in uh, your district, Mr. Cedillo. Um I, I would say also, um, to, to reiterate what my colleagues have said, I think the the conversation that was just had in the prior item um, indicates the complexity of development of supportive housing. Uh, many very uh, technical factors have to be considered. I think what we are asking for is simply to be at the table to have those conversations to make sure that the intent uh, of the PLA uh, proposal is manifested in what is the final product, uh, having to do with cost design, speed of development, and so forth. Uh, so that we don't preclude the opportunity to deliver on the intent of both Triple H and the proposed um, PLA. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, council members. Um, I went ahead and wrote down my, my, my comments just to try to make this as quick as possible. Um, I'm Aisha Jones. I'm a project manager with Venice Community Housing. Um, and we are supportive of the project labor agreement policy for the Triple H funded projects. However, we urge you to consider a few things before moving forward. First, um, it's critical that the PLA policy not be applied to any developments already recommended for approval in the first project expenditure plan or projects already in the managed pipeline. These developments led by our longtime community partners are urgently needed and are too far along to be able to adjust the increased cost of the PLA. Um, second, we believe that the proposed policy can advance good jobs while also balancing negative impacts um, on the number of new permanent supportive housing units we propose to the voters, but that will require our expertise at the table. We urge you to work closely with representative of permanent supportive housing developers to ensure the policy, the proposed policy details are inclusive of the great need for the PSH units and the need for the fair wages and good jobs. Um, Alex, thank you. Um, you know, there are, well, we certainly are supportive of um, providing a PLA um, requirements. Most every major city program that is of this scale that has expenditure of public funds uh, supports the idea of good jobs and local hiring. But as I was reading the motion, I recognize that um, there's very types of PLA programs and we're not we're asking the city attorney here to draft an ordinance but we're not being as specific to what type of PLA program the airport has one CRA had one there's different types of programs so we need to be a bit more specific um, about what we're asking the city attorney to uh, to draft um, I think the the uh, SCAP letter really outlined some good questions uh, that need to be addressed um, and I mean, I certainly don't want to hold this up, but I don't think we're being as clear to the city attorney um, in what we're asking them to do. I may be wrong here, but please, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Anybody? City attorney? H. Sid? Mr. Reamer, yeah. Mr. Reamer? There you are. Hugo Rossiter, Deputy City Attorney in the Labor Relations Division. Good afternoon, John Reamer, uh, Director of Bureau of Contract Administration. Um, let me let me take a stab at going at this first. Um, 
what I've heard thus far and in looking at your motion is that there is a consensus that we want to create an environment where um, good jobs are afforded um, all those who are participating on this process and not just jobs but career path. Um, many years ago when this uh, type of agreement was placed in this environment vis-a-vis um, -vis with the CRA, that was the mantra, a career path. And, and I don't hear anything from anyone who came up to the, to the mic today to say any different from that. So the issue for us is going to be timeline with respect to how quickly we get this done and then, as you alluded to, threshold. Um, not if, but when and where this will happen. Um, the project labor agreements, since we've been dealing with them in early 2000, have been successful in achieving career path opportunities for men and women in this city. Um, the training opportunities they receive through apprenticeship programs have been phenomenal. Given the fact that that does not exist, unfortunately, anymore in our what used to be junior high schools, now middle school, vocational opportunities, it is an excellent opportunity for that to happen. And I haven't heard anyone argue against that. So yeah. the issue now would be when it happens. We have not found on our projects that there is a cost increase um, with respect to using a project labor agreement, given the fact that um, certain wages will be paid anyway. Um, and I haven't heard that either. Um, it's just a matter of when and, again, where okay. and what size. So I do appreciate the notion of receiving from council because many of the letters that were alluded to I, I haven't seen, so I would okay. not know what some of the pushback might be. But knowing exactly from stem some standpoint from council where you want us to focus with respect to the yeah. agreements. So for example, there's there's some threshold of how many units are being constructed, right? If it's a smaller number of units, maybe I, and the construction trades would agree, you know, it's just um, they, there's larger uh, projects that may, this, the PLA may be applicable, but I just don't get the sense we've discussed what that sweet spot is or what would make sense at this point or what we're, adver what we're asking you to analyze, right? And we haven't even told you. The CRA um, had a threshold in terms of number of units uh, and their um, uh, PLA, what they call their Construction Careers and Project Stabilization Policy, correct? And, and are you guys familiar with it enough to explain to us whether that makes sense to apply here or not? Or what model are we using that? Or what threshold and what is the right threshold? I, I don't know. These are just questions I have. I right. They, they, they did have one. Um, and with respect to us applying it now, um, I, w I would want to have more information. What did happen in that um, discussion was what was requested today with respect to the parties um, talking about what they wanted to accomplish and, and their interests and concerns, which it sounds like some of that has happened or is in the process of happening now. Um, just knowing from council that you want um, thresholds to identify when and where, um, yes, the specifics without doing the negotiation up front would, would be helpful um, for us to know how to craft this. Mm -hmm. Just taking our existing project labor agreement for the Department of Public Works, I would say mm -hmm. would not be uh, an appropriate match here because we don't address the affordable housing um, scenario. So we yeah. would have to take that in consideration. The other tenets with respect to the project labor agreement as it relates to um, the percentage of hours worked, um, what percentage of disadvantaged or transitional worker hours you would like to have in place, apprenticeship utilization, I think those things would stay consistent as they did with the previous agreement. Okay. So the, the SCAP letter uh, suggests a 75 unit threshold and the outline several reasons why that makes sense. You know, larger projects allow for more economies of scale, so then any extra costs of compliance are better spread over a project with more units, and you list a couple of other things. Um, I don't know if we need more analysis on this. I, I want to slow this down because I think uh, we are in support of applying a PLA here, but um, the issue of, uh, I think the only issue is threshold, but I'm not even sure if there's other details involved in here that we should be aware of that may impact our program. For example, we've committed to the voters that we're going to build 10,000 units of permanent supportive housing. Now, depending on the type of PLA we have, yeah. that commitment may or may not be put in jeopardy. But we don't know that in CVC, those details. We just can't tell the, the city attorney, go draft an ordinance for PLA, and it's affecting our program, but we don't know how. Um, and I'm not quite sure who could provide 
I guess you guys could provide that analysis. The CAO CLA could provide that analysis for us as, as we get more details on how our programmatic goals with HHH are not affected with whatever PLA uh, um, program we put in place. And now, most of us are saying here, even the public speakers, we want them to coexist, but we don't know if they can coexist at this time because you don't know what we're asking you to do or the city attorney to do. Is that, am I missing something? No, or, no I, uh, I mean, I, I, I'd have a question for Mr. Reamer. Um, so the PLAs that I know about um, focus on projects that are much, much different than uh, a dispersed set of housing projects throughout the city, right? Even even the program to build fire stations and police stations is correct is different than this. Correct. Uh, do you have anything that approximates this uh, kind of project? I, I'm I'm curious about our just our um, our pipeline of affordable housing in general. Is is there anything that approximates this that where you would have as a starting point or or uh, where we at least know the questions to ask or the right. key levers, because I'm concerned too that threshold is the question that we heard about. I would imagine there are a bunch of other ones. Yeah, I mean the CRA is the only one that we have, it, and it's it's obviously somewhat dated. Um, I mean there are things that have uh, just with respect to the economy itself that have happened. Um, Metro has a project labor agreement that addresses um, transit-oriented development. Um, mm. That's more recent. That's pretty cool. Um, I mean, those are the two region-wide that uh, one could draw to to, to get an idea. Um, but it, it, just sitting here before you today, you have the parties. No one is saying no to this. They're just saying, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. um, this is not unlike what happened with CRA. So it's your saying, the parties need to get together. And this needs to be a, not a long drawn out, but a very detailed discussion as to, okay, what are the issues, what are the, uh, what are the problems or the challenges that will get in the way of us hitting the mark? And I say us, collectively. We're all saying we want to do this, both sides. No one's saying no to this. So what, what are the issues? And, and this is just a good old-fashioned negotiation to come up with a number. Yeah, let, let me suggest uh, for us, there's, uh, I think, a couple things that, that scream out at us, and I appreciate you're bringing a uh, history uh, to the table here. We're relying on your, your experience. Uh, there is the C CRA experience that the city has had. But I think a couple of things we've heard. Everybody wants a seat at the table. That's fine. As you said, people are committed to this. We have these goals that are part of HHH, but there's other things uh, that we want out of HHH and all things, right? We want to end the, the segregation and the aggregation in, in, in Skid Row and, and the handful of districts that this has. We now look at everything we do with a community benefit uh, assessment or com community benefit agreements. What are the things that we can utilize that will help us move these projects in uh, areas that are not traditional, right? That we help the, the Councilman Correts uh, do a project that makes it more favorable to the west side and to other more uh, uh, areas that benefit more from the economy. What? Uh, how do we do local hiring? I mean, this, this is a new economy. We, we want to make sure that, that uh, uh, disadvantaged youth are, are given opportunities here, men and women, uh, through these apprentice programs that exist with uh, working with the trades. Uh, we want to also look at local sourcing. I mean, we're constantly spending billions of dollars in the city and then subbing everything out to places in Orange County or the IE or the high desert or outside the state. So these are the types of things that we're looking. We want to make sure that vets always get a fair opportunity. What are the comparables? You indicated the, the stuff we're doing with Metro. Where, where are the other comparables? I mean, we did the, uh, Mr. Wiesar, you were president of the school district when you led the charge on the bonds and the building of all the schools in the region. Uh, what were those experiences that we could rely on? And so I, I trust your leadership. I trust the commitments that have been articulated uh, by the developer community. Uh, I know I'm glad to see that Ron is still in the room, or Ron Miller for the building trades. Uh, they're constantly negotiating, and so I think uh, what we need is given these kind of parameters that you guys sit down and begin to hammer something out for us to look at. Mr. Studio, yes, to, to add to your comment, I think we're, we're missing a step here where when we were, when I was on the school board, this took some negotiation and, and some discussion took place between the trades 
and our school facility staff that said we're committed to this now let's come up with some parameters that make sense and then that was presented to the board but here we're telling the city attorney go draft it without the city attorney knowing what to draft so that step needs to happen and in light of us not wanting to miss our next round as well with the, 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 a lot of work needs to be done so that we could ask the city attorney to draft the ordinance and we don't miss the next round of RFPs as well but you would agree that discussion needs to happen correct with discussion the, should happen but yeah. it should happen framed around again the parameters you provide yeah the parameters the framework and then we could ask the city attorney to then draft those yeah, one, items one thing I would say is that Yes, this PLA is going to be different from the large project PLAs uh, that the city does now. But I, once you decide uh, and make a policy decision as to what kinds of sizes or numbers of values of projects that you feel it's appropriate to apply the PLA to in and of itself, I think you find that the rest of the elements, the local hire, the community benefits, um, uh, reaching out to disadvantaged groups. We, we have had uh, over w well more than a decade of, of experience of developing this language in, mm -hmm. in the PLAs. And I think those provisions in terms of local impact are pretty much, w we're, we're at the point of the spear around the country in terms of doing, uh, having those kinds of provisions. So the, really it's the threshold question that is the policy decision and then once mm -hmm. that, I think the rest of it would, rel relatively speaking, go relative, go very, very quickly. Wouldn't you, yeah. John? Yeah. Okay. Good. So why don't we, uh, we're coming back to discuss um, at some point the guidelines for the next round. I think if we could, if I could suggest that we direct the CAL, CLA, CAO, Bureau of Contract Administration to um, discuss with the trades and and uh, stakeholder group of service providers, um, developers, and the nonprofits in the uh, uh, homeless uh, sector to uh, present to us recommendations at that meeting. I don't know how much time do you guys need for for that. We're probably trying to do something within the next three weeks. <laughs> Is that realistic or do we need 60 days? Yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. I mean, because there's also local hire. Uh, this just, just has one of those in my gut. It feels like it seems simple, but. Could be a little complicated. Yeah, <laughs> I just think it could be. It has potential. Well, also, we don't want to lose substance of, of, of work product. Right. Can we say 60 days? Yeah, let's come back in 60 days with a right. proposal, but. To definitely take in the input from the developers of the affordable housing and homeless housing, um, along with uh, the trades and, and our city staff. And our city staff. Okay. okay. Um, Six days. Sure. Oh. Okay. We're well, good then. Okay. Six days. This yeah. way, three weeks is not realistic for anything. Yeah, it's not realistic. Yeah. Let's be real. <laughs> okay. In uh, six days, a report back. So we'll continue you. for sixty days. This is scheduled for council on Friday, so Friday you'll need to refer it back to committee. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. And then we'll, uh, with those uh, directions or broad parameters. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there the consent? Yes, yeah, we have consent. Items there? You wanna Mr. Chair, so would you like to go to the housing? Yeah, do we go to housing? Yeah, we go to the housing meeting now. And uh, thank you. Who's We're the, the same housing? gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we, Mr. Chair, um, there. can we reconsider item one? I think the intent there was not only to do the facilities, but the housing uh, guidelines as well. So it's 1C as well, 1C, 2C, and 2D, correct? Is that? Okay, w one is approved. And all of its A, A, B, C, they're all approved. Okay, so, so we want to recondition two that I asked about. Is it 2C and 2D that will be continued? And 1C. And 1C to be continued. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's just that, clarify. Okay. Thank you. Okay, it's clarified. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I understand that you want to take items three and four on consent, Mr. Chair. Is are we convening uh, housing? Yes, yes, sir. Housing committee is convened. Quorum present. Mr. Chair, I just have this whole four just for just a comment. Okay. So approve three. Approve three on consent. Anybody? Item three, briefly, Mr. Chair, have HID report relative to the 80th and Vermont development project. 
Without objection, so be the order. Item number four, Mr. Senator Price. Yeah, quickly, Mr. Chair, just if I could read in the record. Item number four, HCID report relative to an RFP for uh, IT vendors. Just want to make sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we do as much outreach as we can on this. I know there were two um, two vendors selected. I don't know if the if the plan is to to select two more or is there going to be a a, 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 two, a pool of ten or what, what's the idea again here? Um, so in the report before you, name, uh, excuse me, my name is Greg Kong, Director of Systems of HC. Thank you. Um, in the report before you, the Housing Department is requesting for authority to issue an RFP to select one or more vendors to provide IT services, professional services. So it really depends. Um, the nature of this contract is to select more than one vendor. And every time we have a job um, that needs to be done, we would request for mini bids, mini bids from these vendors. And then depending on the competitive nature of the proposal, we would select one or the other. So it really depends. We want to leave that uh, as a flexible option. Depending on the proposed souls that we get from this RFP, we may choose. Um, definitely will be at least two, but uh, we may choose more than two depending on the competitiveness of these bidders. I understand that. I'm just encouraging you to have a diverse pool of, Absolutely. of uh, providers that you're going out to that you're informing of this opportunity. Okay. All right, let us uh, reemphasize our commitment to make sure that as we do projects going forward, that we want to make sure that the uh, local communities, people benefit, women, organizations, et cetera, uh, get an opportunity to bid and participate in the, uh, uh, the benefits that, this, that all these um, contracts will provide. For Absolutely. People. That's already part of the RFP process. Thank you. So, and, and we appreciate that. We, we like to stay focused on the execution of those components. Absolutely. We're good? Good. Motion to approve. So no objection. Second. So be the order. We're takes to item two or five. Oh, is this the, uh, the item number two is the round two tax uh, credit report. Sen Senator um, Price moves to adopt. Any objections? Mr. Chair, you should be uh, adopting the CAO recommendations on item two. Yeah, now we're on number, item number five. That's correct. Uh, item number five is an HCID report relative to the Crenshaw Redevelopment Area Sun Blight designation. Any questions, colleagues? Just, just one uh, comment. Again, uh, District 9 certainly is not in the Crenshaw Redevelopment Area, but I believe we might have a, a little blight left over. <laughs> I'm just wondering how we can get nine included in this study. Or do I request the report back to identify areas of blight in CD9? Is that better? Yes. More articulately art Good expressed? Afternoon. Good afternoon. Janet West with the Housing and Community Investment Department. Um, if a council member has an area they'd like to get studied, we need to have some funding identified. And then we can um, select, we do a request for proposals, or we're actually also trying to cr uh, create, we have a list of uh, consultants that we do request for bid and ask them to do that. We're working on one now in CD15. Okay, well, we would like that, so we'll have a conversation with okay. you about that. <laughs> that's, all, that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is understood to be in a more comprehensive sense, and then we'll work with individual council offices on, on the funding. Now is, this, excuse me. now, is this different from the SEDS? Study. Yes, this is, this is very fairly no. This is a this is for a fairly specific purpose, for the community development block grant program, in order to use some of the funds for slum blight as opposed to benefiting low mod area national objective. We have to have an area studied every ten years, and so in this case we had a couple projects already funded, in the uh, Crenshaw area that needed this type of um, designation in order to uh, qualify the projects. And it had expired, the 10-year period that we had had expired. We had to use the former redevelopment area. You don't have to use a redevelopment area. Um, we can't. We just chose to do that because we already had some projects that were in the pipeline on that. And we wanted to be able to continue um, 
those projects, but it's a very narrow purpose for the CDBG program only. Okay. We'd like to talk to you about a narrow purpose in a night. Sure. <laughs> Move to adopt recommendation. Move. No objections? Objections. So be the order. That concludes the agenda. Uh, I think just clarify with him. I think he's understood that this is comprehensive. To look at CD9. CD9 and, and but other. And others to look at this in a comprehensive way. So not other amendments. Thank you. Well, that concludes the agenda. Thank you. Agenda is uh, concluded. File is clear. Motion to adjourn.